In this video we're going to look at the Zeeman effect which describes how an electron orbiting an axis interacts with a magnetic field. So we're going to have some magnetic dipole moment M that is generated by an electron traveling in an orbit around this axis here. So this magnetic dipole is going to be equal to the current which that electron creates times the area in which it around which it travels. So for each of these individual components here the current is just going to be the charge flowing over time so that's going to be the charge of, the, of whatever charge particle Q uh, times the velocity over 2 pi r the total perimeter it's going to be traveling there. And for the area the area is just going to be the area of this circle or whatever shape it encloses but if it is a circle then that's going to be pi r squared. So if we multiply those two together what we're going to get is that this magnetic dipole is going to end up being the charge of the particle times its radius from the axis times its velocity over two when you multiply those two together there. Okay, but in a more general case, if we've got just a general charge particle with some magnetic dipole where it's a vector m, uh, maybe I'll just give these hats here. It's kind of hard to draw them thick like I would on paper. So I'll say that this magnetic dipole would equal the cross product of the position vector r and the velocity vector v uh, divided by 2 and just uh, generalizing the same formula to three dimensions and a general path. If you're not familiar with cross products or dot products between vectors, um, you could look that up now. Uh, that becomes useful later as well. But um, for now, I'll just that's all I'll say about that for now. And this will also be equal to two times the mass times the angular momentum vector. Now to do a sidebar on angular momentum for a second. Angular momentum, if we remember, is the cross product of position relative to some axis of rotation and momentum. And momentum is just mass times velocity. So this r cross p is equivalent to the mass times the cross product of that position vector and the velocity vector. So in this case it would be the cross product of this r vector here and this v vector here which are perpendicular to each other in the case of circular motion. Okay, so I've got this uh, angular momentum vector here. So substituting in values which are specific to an electron we have the charge of it is minus e minus the charge of the electron 1.60 times minus uh, 19th coulombs, so E is the magnitude of that charge, over 2 times the mass of the electron, times its angular momentum vector. Okay, then the potential energy, um, the V, or we could call this uh, VB perhaps for a magnetic field B, is going to be minus that magnetic uh, dipole vector M, and the dot product of that with some magnetic field B. Now in the case where we have a magnetic field which like this which is just going in the positive Z direction then this dot product is going to reduce to minus the component of this dipole magnetic dipole in the Z direction times the component of the magnetic field in the Z direction or just all of it if the uh, magnetic field is entirely in the Z direction. So substituting in what we have up here for the value of m, that's going to give us the magnitude of the electron's charge times z component of the magnetic field over twice the mass of the electron times its angular momentum in the z direction. Okay, so now this allows us to define a new Hamiltonian for an electron if it's in a magnetic field which is in the z direction. So we have, our, we have our original Hamiltonian for the uh, electron up here, and that's its kinetic energy, this term, uh, m plus its potential energy, which is the Coulomb force of it interacting with a proton. So our total Hamiltonian 
is going to become this reference Hamiltonian H naught, the hydrogen atom Hamiltonian, plus the potential energy we get from its interaction with this magnetic field in a z direction, plus bz over 2me. And then we have the operator for angular momentum in the, L, in the z direction, which is our LZ operator, which is, if we remind ourselves, LZ is just minus IH bar d d v. Okay, so that's all fine and good. So we would get a new Schrodinger equation here, which would be H naught psi plus E BZ over 2 ME LZ acting on psi equals E psi. And luckily the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian for the hydrogen atom are also eigenfunctions of LZ. So our original eigenfunctions are going to be eigenfunctions of this new Hamiltonian as well. So we don't have to define new eigenfunctions, we just have to define what the new eigenvalues are, what the energies are going to be. So our energies, which are going to depend on n, the quantum number n, and also the quantum number m, so the m sub l, or m, which is often referred to as the magnetic quantum number, uh, possibly the reason why they chose m for it, because it interacts with a magnetic field when we have some magnetic field. So that's just the energy of the original Hamiltonian, me e to the fourth, 8 epsilon naught squared, h squared, n squared, and then plus this constant beta b times m, the magnetic quantum number, m, times the strength of, mag of the magnetic field in the z direction, uh, which is bz. Okay, so what is this new constant here, this b sub z? So this is going to be equal to the charge of the electron times h bar over 2 times me. So if you substitute in this operator here and then multiply times this, act on the wave function, you'll get this result back here. And the value of this, uh, what we're going to call the Bohr magneton, which is a physical constant here, it's going to be 9.274 times 10 to the minus 24th joules per Tesla. And Tesla is just a unit of magnetic field strength. And again, this is called the Bohr magneton. Bohr magneton, in my terrible handwriting there. Okay, so what is the net effect in this case? So what we have is if we take our original energy levels, if we have some s orbital, well, the m sub l for all s orbitals is going to be zero. So there's going to be no change in the energy. What I'm going to be plotting here for each of these cases is going to be E going up here. This is going to be for the s orbitals. For p orbitals, there are originally three p orbitals, which would have been degenerate, but they will split into three different energy levels based on their value of m, whether it's plus one, zero, or minus one for l equals one, or p orbitals. So p orbitals, if you have a non-zero value for their magnetic quantum number m, they will have a, a separating of energy levels there. They will no longer be degenerate. And similarly, for the five d orbitals, every set of d orbitals is going to have five of them. And they will separate into five different energy levels based off of the, the value of m in their cases which this is d, and these would be uh, magnetic quantum numbers plus 2, plus 1, 0, minus 1, and minus 2. And then just so we note this carefully, we have this separation between subsequent energy levels there is just going to be this constant. It's going to be uh, beta b times, times bz for every 
unit of m which they're apart. So this Zeeman effect takes an it takes a hydrogen atom which has these original energies h naught, and then and then uh, in t when they interact with a magnetic field, s separates them into different energy levels, and the strength depends upon the magnetic quantum number n. Um, this physical constant, the Bohr magneton, and the strength of the magnetic field in the z direction, bz.